In this chapter, we look at international risks, in particular focusing on currency risks, which, for this syllabus purposes, falls under the heading of financial risk. Now, this is a highly, highly examinable topic, and the issues that we're going to cover in this chapter are tested in most papers. The theme, really, is the additional risks that any company, or indeed any organization, runs when it starts to either operate abroad or even competes with other organizations which operate abroad. You bring in the international dimension, you bring in a whole new range of risks. We're going to cover in this chapter three different types of currency risks that organizations face. Economic risk, translation risk, and transaction risk. These are critical concepts in this paper, very, very frequently tested. You must understand what each of these are and how they are different to each other because they are three very, very different types of risk. We'll also cover product and cultural risks and some other risks that are involved in operating internationally. These are a bit more general. They involve quite a lot of common sense, quite a lot of uh, just thinking through different situations. But it's very, very useful to understand the range of risks here because it will help you generate ideas in an exam situation and you can then think about whether those particular risks are applicable to the scenario you've been given. Now, as we've already seen, what we're looking at in this chapter are the types of risks faced internationally as opposed to domestically by organizations. The first of those is currency risk, and you may see this referred to in the paper as exchange rate risk. Thinking about our general definition of risk in this paper, and it's, we keep coming back to this because it's very important to be clear about it, what we mean by risk is what could go wrong. So when we talk about currency risk or exchange rate risk, what we mean is what could go wrong as a result of changes in the value of currencies. So currencies change value all the time, and things can go wrong because of that. What are they? And that's what we're going to cover in the first part of this chapter. Now, the first concept is economic risk. Key concept. It's one that the examiner refers to frequently in post-exam guidance. Also says that a lot of students don't understand particularly well, so it's something they're going to carry on testing, I think, until the results improve. So it's very, very important to be clear about this. Now, economic risk is a very, very broad concept. It means the value of the firm's future cash flows being influenced by foreign exchange movements. So it's any sort of change in foreign exchange rates that influences the long-term cash flows of the organization. Now, this can take a number of different forms. We're going to start by using a very, very simple example to illustrate the concept of economic risk, to illustrate one form that economic risk can take. So let's say we have an organization, UK company, very simple business. It's importing something from the US for $150 and selling it in the UK for £200. So this is a company that's operating internationally. They're importing goods from overseas and then they're selling them domestically. And then we'll do a little bit of modeling of what happens to their profits per transaction, assuming a dollar sterling exchange rate of $1 to the pound, $1.50 to the pound, and $2 to the pound. Now, that may seem like a big range, but within the last um, uh, few years or so, the dollar sterling exchange rate has perhaps not quite fluctuated to those extremes, but it's fluctuated fairly close to it. So this isn't a completely outlandish range of movement to think about. Now, we're selling in the UK for £200. So whatever happens, our sales are going to be £200. That's fixed. What's going to change are our costs because we're paying $150 and our costs are clearly going to be heavily influenced by whatever the dollar sterling exchange rate is. If the exchange rate is $1 to the pound, then those $150 are going to cost us £150. 
and that means our profits on this deal are going to be £50. £200 sales, £150 costs. So far, so good. Now, if the exchange rate moves to $1.50 to the pound, and we're still buying these goods for $150, how much is that $150 going to cost us? Well, it's going to cost us £100. So we're going to pay £100 in exchange for those $150 in order to buy our goods. Our profit now is £100. And then let's say that the dollar moves to $2 to the pound. We're still buying our goods for $150, but those $150 now are just going to cost us £75. Every pound is going to buy $2. So our profitability now is going to be £125. So we're seeing a bit of a swing here in the dollar sterling exchange rate, and as we can see, that has a pretty dramatic impact on the profits that we're making. What is actually happening as the pound moves here, as the rate moves from $1 to $2 to the pound, is that the pound is strengthening. The pound is buying more dollars. So in this situation, let's call it 1. The pound is only buying $1. In this situation, 2. The pound is buying $2. So as the pound gets stronger, then the cost of our imports reduces. And that's what happens when a currency appreciates. When a currency appreciates, imports become cheaper. Now, that's good news for organizations that are importing goods and then selling them domestically. They're going to make more profits. As we'll see, it's bad news for any organization that's exporting because their exports will become more expensive. So assuming that these transactions are repeated over and over again, the important point to take away is the significant impact of currency movements on our profitability. So what we've seen is one very simple way in which currency movements can affect profits. But what other ways can currency movements affect profits and affect the value of our cash flows? Well, in order to illustrate that, we're going to take a scenario here. It's a scenario that's actually not uh, unrealistic and has been paralleled in a number of past exam questions. So XPLC is a large manufacturing company based in the UK. So let's start drawing up a diagram. There's quite a bit of information here and it may help us. So we've got a manufacturing company based in the UK. So its base currency for trading is going to be sterling. It's going to report its profits in sterling. It has subsidiaries in Europe. So it has subsidiaries that are in Europe and presumably operate in euros. So there's already some foreign exchange exposure there. We also have imports from Asia. So we're importing certain of our raw materials from Asian countries and those presumably are going to be let's say, various Asian currencies, dollars, whatever they are, but there's going to be other currencies for our imports. And as we've seen, change in the currency of our imports affects the price of our imports, which is going to affect our profitability. It exports a large proportion of its goods to the US. So in terms of its sales, Quite a lot of them go to the US and therefore are almost certainly going to be priced in US dollars because, in general, you will price your goods uh, in the currency of your customers. It faces, com faces competition from companies all over the world in all of its markets. So, for example, in the US market, it's also going to face competition from companies from, let's say, uh, Latin America, Asia, maybe Africa. Yeah, so there, there's going to be other competitors uh, who are based in other countries. The question being asked here is, 
in what ways might X PLC experience economic risk? So given this mini scenario, how many ways can you come up with in which the cash flows are going to be affected by economic risk, by currency movements, and can you explain how? Can you explain how a change in a certain currency could impact their profitability? This is a really, really important question. So press pause, take some time to think about it, and then press play again when you're ready to debrief. Okay, so let's look at all the different ways in which this UK company could be affected by changes in different currencies. Let's run through these in no particular order. So firstly, we, because we have subsidiaries in Europe, what that means is that those subsidiaries will be recording their revenues and their profits, they'll be, they'll be earning their money in euros. Therefore, if the euro depreciates against sterling, what that's going to do is it's going to reduce the value of the profits that we get from our subsidiaries. So that's going to reduce our profits from subsidiaries. Because those profits are going to be in euros. Let's say it's 100 million euros we're getting from our subsidiaries. That 100 million euros is going to be worth less to us in sterling if the euro depreciates. Secondly, we're importing goods from Asia and we're paying for those goods in Asian currency. If the value of those Asian currencies goes up against sterling, it's going to increase our costs. Because those goods that we're paying for are going to become more expensive just because of the currency they're, uh, they're priced in. Now, if our costs go up, we might be able to increase our prices to compensate for that, but we've been told we're in a competitive market, so it's quite likely that we won't be able to do that. So an increase in costs is going to lead to a reduction in profits. So that's a risk to our longer-term cash flows. We're also selling to the US, and it's highly likely that we're pricing those goods in US dollars. Now, if the US dollar goes down, what that's going to do is it's going to reduce the value of our sales. Let's say we're selling 100 million US dollars worth of goods. If the dollar goes down, then that 100 million dollars is worth less to us than it would have been previously. Now again, we could try and put our prices up to compensate for the reduction in the US dollar, but we're in a competitive market, so we may not be able to. What that means is that if the value of our sales goes down, then our profits are going to go down as well. And then you also have an effect from this competition that we face. And this is actually a very, very pervasive aspect of economic risk, and it's not always that well understood. So let's say we have a competitor in Latin America. Let's say we have a, a, a competitor who's based in Mexico. What that means is that if the Mexican peso goes down against the US dollar, then the goods produced by that Mexican company become cheaper. And our competitors' goods become cheaper. Let's say that sterling is stable against the US dollar, so our goods are not becoming cheaper. What this means is that customers will start switching from buying from us to buying from our Mexican competitor, just because they're cheaper. So therefore, we're going to face increased competition. We are likely to have reduced sales, or perhaps we need to cut our price. Either way, it's going to reduce our profit. Now what you can see is that this isn't only going to apply to sales that we're making in the US. It could apply to sales that we're making in our home market, the UK as well. Maybe in our home market we have a Mexican competitor, and if the Mexican peso goes down, it's going to make their goods cheaper. So actually, we could be a company that doesn't import or export anything, and we are still exposed 
to economic risk, we're still exposed to competition. Because if our competitors' currencies depreciate, it's going to make them cheaper and it's going to make them more competitive against us. So this is why economic risk uh, is quite so pervasive, even if you don't have international exposure yourself. So, so there's lots of ways that economic risk affects organizations, and it's very, very important that you understand all of these. Now, one point I would make is that what we've looked at throughout this debrief is the downside. We've looked at the what could go wrong. But for every factor I've talked about, there is also an upside. So if the currencies move the other way, it's going to benefit us. If our, the Asian currency that our imports are in depreciates, it's going to make our imports cheaper. It's going to increase our profits. If the US dollar goes up, it means that it's going to increase the value of our export sales when we translate them back into sterling. If the euro goes up, it's going to increase the value of those earnings we get from our subsidiaries. And let's say the Mexican peso goes up against the US dollar, it's going to make our Mexican competitor more expensive compared to us. So we do stand to gain as well potentially from currency movements, but clearly from a risk management point of view, we are going to be more concerned about the downside. It's also very important to understand translation risk and transaction risk. Unfortunately, those ideas are a little bit more straightforward. Translation risk is a risk that affects your statement of financial position, or balance sheet as it used to be called. And it only affects your statement of financial position. It affects an organization if it has assets or liabilities in a foreign currency. Because at the year end of the organization, those assets and liabilities are going to have to be translated back at current rates. So year end, they have to be translated at current rates. And that is in line with the principle of fair value accounting, that you have to show your assets and liabilities in general at fair value. Now what that means is if you have an asset in a foreign currency you are exposed to the risk that the currency of that asset depreciates, that it goes down. So let's say for example you have a factory in the US. That factory is going to be in your statement of financial position at a certain value and the value is going to be in US dollars because you paid for it in US dollars, it has a market value in US dollars. Let's say the US dollar goes down against sterling, that is going to reduce the value of your factory. You're going to have to state that factory at a lower value in your statement of financial position. Now that, in a sense, doesn't matter too much because the factory is the same as it always was, it's generating profits as it always did, there is no impact on cash flow. But it is a reduction in your assets and that is something you're going to have to recognize through your income statement. So it could perhaps have an implication for the way investors perceive you, maybe even for your ability to pay dividends. Similarly, you may have a liability in a foreign currency. Let's say you've got a loan in euros for whatever reason. Now if the euro goes up against sterling during the year, then the value of that loan is going to increase. And if you have a liability that increases in value, that reduces the value of your balance sheet, your statement of financial position, and again, you're going to have to take a charge through your income statement. Now, as with all these risks, there is a potential upside here too. Let's say the US dollar goes up against sterling, your factory becomes more valuable, you're going to show again. And if the euro goes down against sterling, then you're going to have a smaller loan, and that's going to be a gain too. But clearly, you are exposed to, to some downside if uh, foreign currencies move a certain way. Now, transaction risk is in some ways the most obvious currency risk and when we come to look at ways of managing currency risk this is the one we're mostly going to focus on for reasons that will become clear. Now as it's defined here, 
transaction risk arises when you enter into a transaction or possibly a series of transactions in a foreign currency and you agree a price. Now when you agree a price and you make a transaction it's usual for settlement, the actual cash to be handed over quite a lot later maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe three months, maybe even more. So the risk is that by the time the cash is settled, by the time you actually pay, the exchange rates have moved. And what that means is that you will either end up paying or receiving a different amount of money to the amount you thought when you actually agreed the transaction. It's a really important concept, so let's illustrate it with a quick example. Let's say that I am selling goods to a US customer and I have agreed a price of $100. Now let's say that at the time I agreed that, I've agreed that it's in January, and the ex current exchange rate is £1 equals $1.50. So as far as I'm concerned, that $100 that I've sold my goods for is going to mean that I get about £67 in sterling. So that's what I'm really interested in. That's the amount of sterling revenue I'm going to get. But I give my US customer three months credit. So when they actually come to settle in April, I'm going to exaggerate this to make the point, but let's say there's been a massive upheaval in the currency markets and that one pound now will buy me two US dollars. The dollar has depreciated massively. There's been a crisis of confidence and the rate now two dollars to the pound. What that means is that my customer is going to pay me my hundred dollars and it's actually only going to be worth fifty pounds to me. So we see a reasonably substantial reduction in the amount of cash we're going to get for our goods compared to what we assumed when we set the price. Now I've taken an exaggerated example there, but many companies do many overseas transactions in many different currencies. So the cumulative effect of this sort of thing happening can, in practice, be very, very significant. Now you do also need to be aware of a number of other types of risk that affect organizations that operate internationally. Firstly, we have political risk. Now, all organizations face political risk. It's always possible that government will do something that damages your interests. However, organizations that operate overseas quite often face increased political risk. So this goes up if you operate overseas. There's a number of reasons for that. One reason is that if you're operating overseas, it's quite likely that you're not as familiar with the political system as you are in your home country. So perhaps you're not able to protect your interests as well as you are in your home country. Another issue is that quite often governments treat their home country companies more favorably than overseas companies. So they might perhaps pass laws uh, to increase taxation on overseas companies. In extreme cases, you might see something like confiscating the assets of overseas countries. In some less stable countries, it's been known. So all organizations face political risk, but it does increase when you go overseas. You're also going to have risks uh, relating to your product and perhaps not understanding other cultures. It may be that you're selling a product that is not acceptable or perhaps that you're not really taking account of the local culture in how you operate. Now there's quite a few examples in corporate history of companies that have gone abroad and it hasn't worked out well really because they haven't understood uh, the culture particularly well. One very high profile one a few years ago was Walmart. Now Walmart is by far the biggest retailer in the world, um, absolutely dominates the US retail market and a number of years ago they decided they were going to enter Germany. They were going to enter the German market. And a lot of German retailers were very, very concerned about this. Walmart has huge expertise. They have a lot of scale. Uh, they were a very formidable competitor. They bought a number of German retailers, brought them together as Walmart Germany, and started trading. Now, to cut a very long story short, it was a bit of a disaster because what Walmart found was that the ideas of customer service were very different in the US compared to Germany.
they found themselves in trouble uh, with the local legal system because of their uh, refusal to recognize trade unions. Now, Walmart in the U.S. famously doesn't recognize trade unions, and in the U.S. Uh, that's pretty much okay. People accept that. In Germany, that is completely unacceptable. So various other ways as well. They, they really didn't take account of the local market. They saw pillowcase is the wrong size because they didn't understand German pillows were a different size, you know, just in silly ways like that. And the cumulative effect was Walmart actually had to get out of Germany at a considerable loss. So that's how significant this sort of thing can be. There have been a few sort of smaller scale examples of organizations uh, that have made some big mistakes in doing this. Uh, famously, Vauxhall, car company, subsidiary of General Motors, when they went into uh, the Spanish market, uh, they sold their car uh, called the Vauxhall Nova. Now, most places, Vauxhall Nova is a pretty good name, pretty catchy, uh, pretty exciting. Uh, what no one seemed to realize at Vauxhall was that in Spanish, Nova means doesn't go. So perhaps it wasn't the best name for a car, and that was changed pretty hastily. Recent high profile example with Marks and Spencers, uh, when they opened their store in Shanghai, they based their sizing of the clothes that they were stocking on their Hong Kong store. Now, this was failing to take account of the fact that the demographic in Shanghai is very different to the demographic in Hong Kong. In particular, with their underwear, what they found was that they sold out very rapidly of the smaller sizes of underwear, and they couldn't sell the larger sizes because people generally are smaller. So again, just a small way in which they failed to take account of the local market did lead to, to losses and some reputational damage and some embarrassment all around at Marks and Spencers. There's lots of other examples, um, but this is something that's really, really important for companies to understand. And as we can see, even some very large and sophisticated companies that operate internationally anyway uh, can sometimes get it really wrong. Some additional risks uh, involved in trading overseas. Uh, physical risk, if you are physically shipping goods from one country to another, it significantly increases the risk that the goods are lost or stolen or damaged perhaps. Credit risk increases when you trade overseas, partly because if you don't know the legal system very well, it can be quite hard to enforce payment of goods, and partly because customers may not really feel they need to pay overseas uh, suppliers as quickly. Partly also, you might not know who is creditworthy in the local market. You might not be in such a good position to judge that. And you may get a risk to your liquidity. If you are trading overseas, you are likely to have an increased working capital cycle because you have to tie up money to finance stock that is in the process of being shipped. You may well have to give longer credit terms, so it's possible you could lose some cash. Now, it's worth being aware of all of these so that you can generate ideas if you have a scenario of an organization that's trading internationally. I would say, though, as with all ideas, you must think carefully about whether they are appropriate to the scenario that you've been given, because some of them may be, some of them might not be. You must be tailoring your answer as much as possible uh, when dealing with a scenario. The next lecture example lists out the different categories of risk we've looked at in this chapter and asks you to think about in general terms, what controls could you use to manage these risks? Now, something like this could very easily form the core of an exam requirement. Clearly, in an exam, you'd have a full scenario, and you'd have to tailor your response to that scenario, but you do need to be able to generate ideas like this to get you started. So press pause, have a think, and write down as many controls as you can think of. What would be a reasonable way of controlling each of these risks? And then press play when you're ready for the debrief. So taking economic risk first, one point to make that's quite an important point is that there are real limits to the extent to which you can control against economic risk. As we've seen, economic risk is very pervasive, it's very complex, it includes factors like the behavior of competitors, and it's impossible really to protect yourself against all possibility of, of risk from these areas. That's an important point to understand. But having said that, there are things you may be able to do to mitigate the impact of economic risk. Perhaps one of the most important is diversification. We had a situation in the previous lecture example where 
a UK company was importing, say, from Asia and therefore was exposed, if the price of the Asian currency went up, the imports would become more expensive. Well, let's say you weren't just importing from Asia. Let's say you also were importing from some African countries. In that case, if the Asian currencies went up, you could perhaps switch more of your purchases to your African suppliers and therefore you wouldn't be affected by the currency movement so much. The same is true of sales. If you are selling to different markets, you will perhaps be able to switch between them to take advantage of currency movements. So diversification can reduce its impact that way. The other thing you might be able to do to reduce economic risk is to match your receipts and payments in terms of currency. This would be another approach and going back to our Asian imports as an example, what we have here is a cost in the Asian currencies and therefore if the current Asian currency goes up our costs increase. But let's say we also had sales to those same Asian countries. That way, if the Asian currency went up, our costs would go up, but our sales would go up as well. So that would mean we are less exposed to any particular movement. It will affect both sides, if you like, of our income statement. So if you can match your currency movements in that way, and it's not always feasible, but if you're a large company, you might perhaps be able to do this, uh, then that can be a way of, of protecting yourself. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why car companies in particular tend to have manufacturing plants all over the world. Car companies sell all over the world, and if you're selling in, let's say, India, you're going to have a revenue stream in Indian rupees. If you can also manufacture in India, you also have a cost stream in Indian rupees, and that means you're less exposed to those currency movements. So there are some things you can do to try and mitigate the impact. What about translation risk? Well, here it's a little bit simpler. You can reduce the impact by matching, insofar as possible, your assets and liabilities in terms of currency. So let's say, going back to our previous example, you had a factory in the US. So it's valued in US dollars. The US dollar goes down, the value of that factory goes down. Well, what you could do in that situation is take out a loan in US dollars that more or less matches the value of the factory. That way, if the US dollar goes down, the value of your factory goes down, but the value of your loan goes down too. The two will move in tandem and the overall net impact on your statement of financial position will be zero. So that's a relatively straightforward way of dealing with translation risk, if it's feasible. In terms of transaction risk, well, I'll just mention at this stage that you can fix the currency rate that will apply when you come to settle the transaction. I won't say more about it now because we're going to look at this in a lot more detail in later chapters. There are various very common techniques uh, that are used to fix the rate payable and that will uh, manage your transaction risk for you. What about political risk? What about actions by governments? Well, there are things you can do to reduce that. So, for example, uh, you might want to have negotiations with your host government, particularly if you're a large company. You might want to negotiate the terms on which you'll operate or make sure you're clear about the rules that will apply to you and if you have a good relationship with that government it's less likely they'll do anything to affect you. You can also have some sort of partnership with local firms and this is a very common reason why organizations enter into partnerships such as joint ventures or alliances, or maybe franchises, all the different techniques that you cover in E3. A good reason for doing this is that your local partner probably has the political knowledge and contacts and understanding of the system to help you deal with this risk. Product and cultural risks? Well, a lot of this really comes down to due diligence, it comes down to doing your homework and understanding the local culture and the local market before you enter into it. So if you 
uh, research things like the local tastes you perhaps get advice on labor laws and maybe product laws from local firms it really comes down to doing your homework and understanding what you're getting into before you go into it what about trading and credit risk well clearly insurance is a very common way of dealing with this you can insure your goods against theft or damage uh, you can even insure against non-payment by your customers you can take out credit insurance also you very much want to do credit checking if you're operating in a different country it becomes even more important that you're happy with the credit worthiness of your customers and you may want to go for something like international factoring whereby a factoring company will advance you the amount of your invoice and thus reduce your liquidity problems in exchange for a fee and if you want to they will combine this with credit insurance so that if your customer doesn't pay you will still get your money and obviously that's more expensive but it does help to deal with this risk. So let's sum up the key points in this chapter. What we're covering are the risks of doing business internationally. And I guess the main point here is that any organization operating internationally or even competing with those who operate internationally is exposed to a wider range of risks than an organization that just has to think purely domestically. Currency risk is one of the key risks there, and we looked at the difference, and it's a very important difference, between economic risk, which is the impact on your long-term cash flows of all kinds of different changes in currency prices, translation risk, which is the risk to your statement of financial position of fluctuations in the value of your assets and liabilities, and transaction risk, which is the risk that you agree a price at one currency rate and then it's settled at a different rate. We touched on political risk, the risk that uh, actions of government adversely affect your organization. And this is greater if you go overseas, partly because you don't understand the political system so well, and partly because governments do have a habit of favoring home country companies. There's also product, cultural risk, trading, and credit risk. And it's really important that you understand what you're getting into before you enter a new market. You understand the local culture, how tastes perhaps are different to your home market, that laws are different, perhaps in terms of product liability, perhaps labor laws are, uh, perhaps laws around marketing are different, and you need to understand those, otherwise you may find your venture in trouble. And if you do trade internationally, there is an increased risk of lost or stolen goods, that your customers default, or perhaps that you have liquidity issues because you're financing a longer working capital cycle. As I mentioned before, all of those are very, very important to understand because you may need to generate ideas in a scenario as to the sort of risks an organization is exposed to and operates internationally and how they can control those risks. But please do tailor your answer to the scenario. Don't just come up with this sort of boilerplate list. Think about whether these particular risks and these particular controls are applicable to the organization that you're given.